Namaste. Namaste. Look, I'm sitting in the hole. There we go. Now my feet won't reach the ground. Remember uh, laughing? Yeah, he did the end of the Yeah, <laughs> sometimes from my Fred Flintstone legs, that's what I feel like. Um, to tell you the truth, um, uh, I'm in the, I was telling Jim before we started that I'm reading this Richard Rorschach book. Something that's called, I should know what the title is, right? Something like The Divine Dance. Um, and it's a book about the Trinity. And I had decided I wasn't going to read it because I have not historically been a big fan of the Trinity. Um, I've and always thought... That makes them very sad, by the way. When you're not a fan of them? Yeah. Such is life. <laughs> <laughs> As the old saying goes, people in hell need ice water and I can't help them either. <laughs> but, but, and the reason I didn't like it was that I, I'm not much of a fan of doctrines that create more confusion than they do clarity. I mean, if you can't explain a doctrine in five minutes or less, I think you should either divide it into sections or throw it away. That people need to be able to understand what we're trying to say, and when they can't, then we aren't doing a very good job of saying it. And so there was my ambivalence about the Trinity. Um, until I started, so anyway, I wasn't gonna buy this book, but I'm part of this group on, online called Speakeasy, which is a group for people who blog or talk or speak or somehow flap their gums in a public forum literally or metaphorically, and it's a book review thing. So you can get free copies of books to review. You have to write a review within 30 days and put a little disclaimer on it that said I got the book for free in exchange for a fair and honest review and yada, yada, yada. And sure enough, here comes this book across Speakeasy. And I said, well, if it's free, <laughs> then I, maybe I should read it. And I haven't finished it yet but it's changed my whole thinking about the Trinity. Um, and because of that, it's changed my whole thinking about resurrection. Now I should tell you, as long as I praise Richard Rohr, that Richard Rohr has a co-author co in this book whose name is Mike Morell, and I may be pronouncing that wrong, M-O-R-R-E-L-L, um, who also incidentally happens to be the guy who runs Speakeasy. So I've been Facebook friends with him for a while. And the first reading is also from a, a virtual friend of mine, uh, Dr. Steve McSwain was a Baptist preacher and is no longer. And if I had to describe him, I would say he's a lot like me, uh, which is sad for him. But, <laughs> but he kind of came into that place where he was at odds with his denominational structure and where his, his view of God and Jesus no longer comported with that of his denominational structure. And he wrote a book, which I need to bring in and throw on our bookshelf, called The Enoch Factor, that was actually really, really good. And um, uh, we've never sat down face to face, although we came very close once, um, a few years ago. But his thinking is, is good, and he pushes a more conservative group of folks than I do into seeing things in a different way, trying to step outside of that idea that this is all just, a, life is a performance test. And if we perform well enough, it's going to be okay, and if we don't, well, <laughs> it's, we're going to be roasting weenies somewhere. And when he talks about letting go, it occurred to me, the, the, the metaphor that came to me was, we've all had these friends who were desperate to find a boyfriend or a girlfriend. And they're like, why can't I find anybody? And the answer was, they were trying too hard. And when they finally got angry enough and said, I'm never going to find anybody, I'm going to stop looking, boom. 
16 days after I let go in Washington, D.C. of finding my true love, I met him at church. See? It's true. And it's, it's not just about love. It's about anything. There is such a thing as trying too hard. And, and, and the reason there's such a thing as trying too hard is that, I believe anyway, it, when we try too hard, we're just tense. And, and we're not just focused, but hyper-focused. And, and, you know, so we've got laser pinpoint vision on whatever it is. And, you know, there could be a wind that kicked up $500 bills that would be blowing by our head and we wouldn't see them because we'd be focused on whatever it was. And I think that, that Steve McSwain is right about the faith life, the life of faith being a process of letting go. Not just in the Eastern sense and not just about attachment, but just about the immortal words of St. Rogers of Green Bay. Relax. Relax. And then as I was thinking about this, this gospel and this whole resurrection question, I found this reading from Michael Hawkins, who's a, a Buddhist kind of guy, who I think points out something that's, that's really obvious but sometimes denied. If you want to look at what samsara is in Buddhism, and samsara is, is a word that implies suffering, it's the word they use to describe what it is to be alive on this earth. Um, it is sort of like parallel to the Christian notion of hell. And nirvana is close to the Christian notion <clears throat> of salvation, particularly if you tie nirvana to enlightenment. And it's true and important that uh, people want to say that Buddha was, uh, was opposed to the idea of God. And the truth is, Buddha passed on the question. He said, I'm not here to talk about that. So now we get to the, I have that old, it's really, really dating myself, okay? Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. It was a movie, and I think James MacArthur, who played the original Dano on the original Hawaii Five-0, was in it. It's like in the 50s. And there might have been a remake with Bobby Sherman in it. But I don't want to tell you why I know that <laughs> or admit that I was a fan of Bobby Sherman who famously sang, Julie, do you love me? The poor man's David Cassidy. Anyway, it was about Seven Brides for Seven Brothers was about seven sisters who married seven brothers. This was the uh, prequel to that. It was One Bride for Seven Brothers. <laughs> and... <laughs> And it's a classic exercise in missing the point. It's what happens when we get something that's metaphor, and we try and make it literal. And, you know, I don't know if we look at this literally, who felt worse about the arrangement? Because we've all had friends, at least, with siblings. And we all know that our friend is the sibling we probably like the most. And there's probably one in there that we're thinking, holy cow, how could that one be from the same family as our friend is? And this poor woman had to go through, and she, sooner or later she figured the bad one had to serve, you know. And of course the concern was, and the message of the teaching was, take care of your family and the less fortunate. Or even your brother's widow. And it wasn't about, you know, the mechanics of passing her along. <laughs> but it was rather about caring. And of course the Sadducees, remember now, they were sad, they were you sad. see. Right? They didn't believe in the resurrection, so they were sad, you see. <laughs> and the Pharisees did believe in a resurrection. And so what the Sadducees were trying to do in asking this question is set up an argument to trap Jesus. Um, 
But it raises an interesting point because what is resurrection? Which brings me back to Richard Rohr. Richard Rohr in this book abandons Harold. Harold, of course, being the god who has long white hair and beard and sits on a chair in the closet. And says that, he says more than this, but he says God is relationship. And the Trinity is the Trinity because one, if God was one, an, an individual, if you will, that's a dictator. And that's the Old Testament last week, I think it was, Liz was talking about the Old Testament God not being a very satisfactory God to her. Although she used a little different language. And um, that's because the Old Testament God, by and large, is one. Do this, do that, do that. And it's not really how God was. It was how they perceived God to be. If God is two, now there's a conversation. But it's also possible to become deadlocked. Two is dualism. Two lacks middle ground. Two is it's on or it's off. Especially pertinent today, it's cold or it's hot in here. Uh, and so three becomes community. Three becomes relationship. Three is beyond debate. And the Anglican in me feels compelled to point out three points make a plane and a three-legged stool, and a three-legged stool never wobbles. But more importantly, can we look at Trinity and let go of which one's the most important to us? And, and individual religious or Christian traditions always grab onto one. I mean, there's one they like better. The Pentecostals are waiting for the Spirit to come and knock them on their butt on Sunday morning. Um, evangelicals, by and large, are Jesus-only people. Um, mainline <coughs> folks are maybe God the Father slash Jesus people and are really uncomfortable with the Spirit because they might ask Him to do something that thaws their frozen chosenness. But what if it's not that? What if it's just trying to say God is relationship. And what if we understand three persons of the Trinity as three persona of the Trinity, which comes from this Greek theater tradition of when you were uh, playing a role, you, you would hold a mask in front of your face. Now I'm, now I'm Jesus. Um, I see the resemblance. You see it? Right there. Oh. I have a larger head. Um, <laughs> but if it's facets of God, and if we look at one more idea, that that one person God is a behavior test, a compliance officer, you will do this, you will do this, you will do this, and you're probably going to screw it up. But if you don't, I'm going to be mad, and I'm going to whoop up on you. When we get to Trinity and to relationship, now we have the possibility that God isn't, in fact, about laying down the law, if you will. But God is about being in relationship. And God isn't a physical being. But God is, in fact, found in relationship, which is a little philosophical, I admit, a little abstract. But it changes the whole thing. And what I want to know is if God doesn't have a body, which I don't believe God has a body. Jesus is a little complicated. But why would God be so concerned about resurrecting the body? I mean, wouldn't it make more sense that if God is relationship, and if God calls us into relationship, and if 
it's about, as in the seven brothers for one bride, things like taking care of each other, coexisting, helping each other, being kind. Then what the hell do you need your body for after this life? I mean, we need it to motor us around <laughs> here so we can enter into relationship. But isn't the bigger question what's inside? And should that color our understanding of resurrection? I'm not saying that nothing exists beyond this life. Not at all. I'm not saying, I'm definitely, in fact, not only am I not saying, I, I am saying that it's not, were you a good little boy? It's not Santa God. You know, you better, you better watch out, you better not shout. Better not cry. Better not cry. Not Santa God is coming to town. <laughs> and he's mad as hell. Or I actually saw the bumper sticker yesterday on the back of a booger colored uh, Hyundai, Jesus is coming, look busy. <laughs> well, what, what, what if it's not about all that? And it's about what's in here. Because after all, if I chop off your leg, you're still you. If you lose an arm, you're still you. There, there's an essence that transcends our physical. Maybe that's the great teaching behind Monty Python and the Black Knight. <laughs> <laughs> but are you just going to bleed all over? <laughs> that's right. That's a fresh wound. Is there, if it's not about physical and if it's about relationship, if it's, as Richard Rohr suggests, using a Thich Nhat Hanh term, it's about interbeing. It's about the fact that we are all inseparably interconnected with God and each other, and in fact that interconnection is God, then we can never be lost. Then resurrection is about transformation and evolution. Resurrection is about whatever comes next, but it's not about passing a behavior test. If it was, then your brother or sister would cease to be your brother or sister if they were naughty. Your cousin wouldn't be your cousin anymore if he or she was naughty. It, it calls us to a higher plane, but it also allows us to let go of a lot of this stuff that we're just worried about. You know, all this business about you're going to be called to account for everything you've done when you stand before God after you die. I must admit, I stole some gumdrops from my grandma's candy dish when I was eight years old. Your grandma had gumdrops too? Yeah. Yeah, mine did too. <laughs> Sometimes orange slices too. <laughs> but, but that's such a different perspective. So now we really can let go. Now, if we don't believe exactly the right thing, it's going to be all right, because we try. Now, if we took the Lord's name in vain, that's going to be all right, as long as we cared about each other, we entered into a relationship. And, and the secret to being able to do that really is, I believe, to is seeing that relationship as participation in God. Because that's what it is. And then you start to see, which one of these comments said, uh, people, um, returning, where was it? Steve McSwain, I think. Um, not. It was the second reading by Hawkins. Do you think that Jesus really meant you could get into heaven by reciting a formula like the sinner's prayer? Do you think, or do you think that Jesus, through his teachings and the example of his life, showed us a certain way 
to secure union with, with the Father. I, I think that's it. And I, but I think it would be better to say, to recognize that the union is already there and relax into it. Doesn't mean things aren't going to get rough sometimes. It doesn't mean that everything's going to go our way. But what it does mean is that we have the security that there isn't an ejector button somewhere. And if we accidentally push it, we're going to go sailing out <laughs> of preferred status. You know, we're going to be moved from first class into coach or something. No. That it's a lot more like a symphony than it is a foot race. That it unfolds, that it evolves, that we let it move us. But it really changes everything. And maybe most importantly, it allows us to let go of a fear of whatever happens next.